we have uh, four uh, presentations and um, during this session, and the, the first one will be from Jackie Faraday from the American Museum of Natural History. Okay, great. Thank you. And let me share. I was testing it before, and I think it all worked. <clears throat> um, okay, great. So thanks, everybody. I have no idea what time zone everybody's in. So I'm just going to say hello, because it could be at any point. And I'm, I'm kicking us off on this very exciting session, which is about the idea of using planetarium domes, um, immersive experiences for scientific research. So one quick 10 seconds on me is I'm a researcher. I'm, um, I'm a research scientist at the American Museum of Natural History, but I'm jointly in the education department. And so I'm constantly splitting my brain into thinking about projects that are good for the public and also good for my own scientific research, where I walk into the planetarium dome and I come up with great ideas of how to get my science out with also experiencing things for the public. So Mark, myself, Ryan Wyatt, Anders, several others um, that might even be on this call got together with this idea of putting together a state of the profession white paper for the Astro 2020 panel. And we called it ideas, immersive dome experiences for accelerating science. And my seven and a half minutes here are going to be explaining to you what's in this white paper and how we came up with some uh, recommendations for maybe the next 10 years of how we should think about using planetarium domes. So first, um, as long as my slides actually, maybe they won't. I think I might be a little bit stuck. Oh, there we go. Um, the ingredients to this come in uh, a couple of pieces. Number one, we have planetarium software and planetarium software that I'm gonna highlight that others will probably highlight here um, that we use at the Hayden Planetarium is open space at the openspaceproject.com. You can see what this project is. I'm sure many people on here already know what this is, an interactive data visualization software, which was designed for planetarium experiences. And it is excellent for planetarium experiences, but turns out it's also excellent for reviewing your scientific data, whatever that is, virtually, both in the dome and on your laptop. And so ingredient number one would be for this, um, experiences for accelerating science in a dome is that you need a piece of software that's going to really come to the table for you. So open space is one. There's also worldwide telescope that the American Astronomical Society is now sponsoring. Um, and this software is also another one that looks to grab astronomical data sets and make them more accessible, both for education purposes, but it has a very strong usage right now within the scientific community for examining data. And, and, and here we are as another ingredient on top of planetarium software of we're in the era of big data in astronomy, where we have massive astronomical data sets, which astronomers really wanna dig through in a very real way that is um, multi-parameter and you wanna see everything. And there's a limitation from a research perspective of how far you can go from um, an examination perspective. You're kind of stuck with basically your two-dimensional plots. And you know, we do some things that are in three dimensions, but it's not, we, astronomers aren't the best at, at, at coming up with how to visualize their data. But we're in an era of big data, Gaia DR2, gave us almost 2 billion distances and velocities for stars so that you can map the galaxy in three dimensions. You don't want that in a two dimensional plot. The Rubin Observatory is about to give us the entire sky that can be seen from um, Chile every couple of days, opening up the window into the transient nature of the universe. So pulling those things together in, this is ingredient number four, I guess, in this um, timeline here, is the dome. And so you've got the planetarium software, you've got this big data, and we've got the infrastructure. So we pull these pieces together and we're able to walk into our infrastructures and both explore the data sets from just sort of a curiosity and educational point of view, but also dig into scientific questions with our colleagues 
or as an individual walking in. And this is an, an, a picture of the Hayden Planetarium. Um, that's me at the center there. And this was um, a presentation to scientists. And on the dome here is for the very first time, the Gaia, European Space Agency's Gaia mission data displayed for the first time. Now this was made possible by master's students that were working with Anders Yitterman in um, Sweden that made it possible for us to use the open space software and pull in basically a billion point sources into the dome and we could play with them. You could change the magnitude threshold. You could change which stars were visible or not. You're seeing a lot of artifacts in the data that are become so immediately necessary for us to see as a scientist in such a practical way by just displaying it in the dome. And then the last, the, 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 the last ingredient to put this together, so there's the, the dome, would be the astronomical software. So planetarium software can't do everything. It gets us close, but it won't get you that full, like, are we gonna immerse science by just walking into um, a dome with planetarium software and data? And while you get close, what you want is to be able to have an astronomical software speak to a planetarium software within a planetarium. And that will really throw the science forward. And here's two examples of software packages. One, a multi-dimensional data exploration package called GLUE, which by the way, is going to be used by the James Webb Space Telescope. And then Aladdin, a classic data viewer for astronomical research. Both of these pairs of software, as a research scientist in astronomy, uh, I use these, these, so these pieces of software every day. And so we thought, well, wouldn't it be great if you could make a combination of all of these things? So take a planetarium software, make it speak with your astronomical software using the big data that we all know is out there uh, and then display it in a dome. And so what has been emerging through work um, done by various some people on this call, and I'll just show you a little video example of this, is getting these software packages to speak to each other. So this is a little video rendering of me playing with data. Um, and this is glue. This is the interface of glue, which is showing you multiple, um, multiple subsets of the data. On the one corner is the right ascension and the declination distribution. On the right hand panel here would be me looking at um, the distance distribution. In GLUE, I can select parts of data, send it over into open space, and all of a sudden, number one, I'm looking at the data in three dimensions. These two pieces of software speak to each other, and I can select subsets of the data. So in this way, we have advanced our ability to look at data by doing something so simple. This is so simple in that we have three-dimensional viewing immediately and you can be doing this inside of the planetarium dome. Okay, uh, one more slide and then I'm done. And this is just to show you, this is an example. These are the stories we get to tell now. This is me inside of the dome playing with roughly six million stars that are color coded by their chemistry. This can be done in this shot. This is with education. This is with others there to see it from the education side, but we can also do this with scientists and have our conversations about what we're seeing. Are you seeing a chemical, um, a chemical map that's giving you information about star formation or uh, supernova explosions, all sorts of things that can come out of conversations when you're immersed in the data. And I'll stop there because I know I'm close to the end here. If there's any questions, you can ask them. Otherwise, I think we have our We can next. have questions in the chat, of course, but uh, we better move on now to our next speaker. Okay, I'm gonna try and- Yeah, so, uh, yeah, Th thanks, 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 Jackie. The next uh, speaker will be Tom Jarrett from the University of Cape Town, who will tell us about some of the work happening with the Ezeco Planetarium in Cape Town. Are you, you there? there? 
Oh, oh here I am. I had oh, to, un I, I had okay. to unmute, unmute myself. Now, let me see if I can share. Hi, John. Hello. How come I can't optimize for vids? What's going on? Hmm. Well, I don't know if this is going to work very well then. It's not optimizing. Okay, here we go. So everybody see that. All right, so let me just uh, get my timer on here because uh, this is where it really matters. Okay, uh, just wave at me if you can't hear me. So uh, hello, my name is Tom Jarrett. I'm at the University of Cape Town. I am an astronomer um, and uh, we do visualization in my lab. And let me just get on with it because we're, we're low on time. Um, I also want to actually turn off my video because this might help with um, what I'm about to show you. So I'm gonna do a, a really quick brief overview of what we're doing in our lab. And then I wanna to get to the fun stuff, which is the last three slides where we're working with VR and the full dome. Um, let me just start really quickly with the Toulouse meeting in 2018. This was an absolutely wonderful meeting. I thoroughly enjoyed every minute of it in the, the venue and so forth. Um, but there are two things that stood out for me. And first thing is on the left is the, uh, the African contingent. Uh, this is the germination, the beginning of our, uh, our little group called the African Planetarium Association. You can see us there. We're listening to Mark and he's telling us some words of wisdom. Now on the right, um, the other interesting thing was the Data to Dome session. And uh, there, there you can see a picture of Mark again telling you know, us why it's important to do research with domes. Um, I was part of that session. Now since then, that was 2018, our lab is going full guns. And uh, we've, uh, we've built up many things now. And I just want to give a shout out to these important people. Um, notably, three of them are giving presentations at this virtual conference. Uh, my PhD student, Alex of Italy, and he'll, uh, he'll be giving this talk on Friday. You'll hear more about him in a second. Dr. Lucia Marchetti, who is uh, the project manager for my lab and Dr. Sally McFarland, who is the uh, most important role as far as this group is concerned. She's our planetarium liaison. She stands between the researcher and all the complex equipment and software of our planetarium. Every uh, planetarium needs a Sally. So this is our Viz lab. Let me move on and uh, here we go. Uh, so our lab has four main sort of hardware components, if you will, but the, it's the lower two that matter here. And everything in here is all about immersion and interaction. So for example, what Jackie just showed you is something that we're keenly interested in, which is interacting with our data. So on the lower part, we have our virtual uh, reality system, which you'll hear more about at the end. And of course, our uh, planetarium. Key you see research areas that we do in the lab, and this is what I do professionally, is we do work on large scale uh, structure of the universe. We work on galaxy evolution, infrared, and radio astrophysics is our specialties. Um, and of course, we do 3D visualization and analytics. Um, there's our dome. Uh, you can see uh, Table Mountain in the background, quite lovely. Um, the, uh, this is the, uh, uh, in, the, in, the in the background is the uh, Izeka Museum, and next to it is our actual dome. The two are connected. Um, here's my first movie, and this is, uh, this is something we do in the dome and in my lab, which is what we call particles, which are galaxy catalogs and cosmological simulations. Here, we're looking at the two mass uh, photometric redshift catalog, and we were just zooming around. This is one of the first things we did when we upgraded our dome. Um, here's another uh, large scale structure, uh, something that I published in 2017, where we worked on a gamma field uh, near the North Galactic Pole, and we characterized the large scale structure. Um, you can see these, these yellow uh, things are called the bones of the large scale structure, which is the filamentary structure the filamentary and uh, groups and uh, clusters. So that was something we were keenly interested in. And uh, you're seeing these videos, if uh, hopefully you can see them are actually coming from our dome where we're playing it, we're playing the thing and we're pointing that camera up at the dome and, and hence the, uh, the quality. Um, so those are uh, examples of, uh, of particles. Actually, I think I skipped one, let me see. Well, 
anyway, um, so this is, uh, we also do volume. So this is our volumetric stuff. We work with neuroscientists, cellular and biochemistry and uh, radio astrophysics. Um, here's an example of some of the volumes that we have up, that we have in our data sets and that uh, we've been working with researchers. On the lower right is a mouse brain and uh, it's, being, uh, it's being color coded by uh, the, uh, the, the motor functions of the mouse. And now I'm gonna play you Here's the actual volume of that in our dome, and we're just kind of spinning it around. So you can see the things that have lit up, those are parts of the, the mouse brain that, have, that worry about uh, chasing cheese and that sort of thing. Okay, so that's volumes. Now the, the, the good stuff now is this, is the virtual real reality, which we call our iDavy system. And uh, we are, uh, in VR we can do catalogs, volume rendering, but we also do this cool VR to dome that I want to tell you about. And my student, Alex, this is his real brainchild. It's awesome. So this is a little bit different kind of way of doing VR. And here it's the presenter who wears the glasses and uh, controls the data sets and the audience actually sees what's being projected in through their eyes onto the dome. And um, I do want to uh, uh, shout this out too. This was a fantastic uh, workshop that we did in Colgate last October, and this is where we actually presented these, uh, the first VR to dome, uh, uh, our, our brand new system. And we did it basically on the fly because Alex was back there tinkering with the computer and getting everything up and running. Now here you can see um, Alex is uh, actually describing what uh, Lucia is wearing the, the uh, VR set and she's running the data sets. And, uh, 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 and the audience is down below. Uh, um, Alex is, is standing in Joe Eakin's box there. Thanks, Joe, for allowing us to do that. Uh, Just a quick uh, word. We have to uh, be a little bit careful of time here. Sorry. Gotcha. I got two, two slides. So this is, this is actually the view from uh, Lucia, who's wearing the glasses and the, uh, the headset, and she's manipulating the data set. And now we're way down in there. We're the little tiny people in that lower area, and she's uh, zooming sort of out now, and she's moving the data around. And we down in the dome can actually see this. So you're looking at the two mass redshift survey. Galaxies are color coded by their, how far away they are. Blue's nearby, red's far. This is my last slide. And this is what uh, we in the dome actually see. So we're now sitting there in the beautiful theater at Colgate and Lucia is now waving at us and she's now zooming up the data and she'll move it around. So she's basically plays God. And the power of this is that you can actually work with the data much, much easier than with uh, planetarium software. So you th think about it, this is really a research tool. Um, and uh, yes, I just hit seven and a half minutes. So let me just let that, I've got a couple more seconds and let me just stop that and end there. And this is our Viz Lab. You can see more of the adventures that we're doing. Um, and I'll stop there, Martin. Okay, you. thank you. Uh, so if we can move straight to our next speaker and uh, a reminder to everyone, do stick questions in the chat if you like. Thank you. So uh, Tom Kwasnitska will, will go next. Sure. Um, hey there. Let me share my screen. Uh, looking good. Okay. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Kwasnitska. I am a researcher at um, the GEOMA Marine Research Institute in Northern Germany. So we're not a planetarium, we have one, um, but we are a marine research institution and we deal with pretty much anything um, that has to do with a sea apart from big whales, we don't do those. Um, we operate a dome, as I said, which is the Arena 2 um, simulator. Um, we built a dome instead of a cave, you could say. It's a six meter suspended dome. We can tilt it any way we like to. Um, it's got a 4K 120 hertz stereo system and it's through the VRPN tracking protocol. You can actually track the head of um, viewers just like you would do in a cave. Um, only we use the dome um, to go in with several people at once and we operate this 
exclusively for research. We don't actually do public screenings of any sort, especially not this year, of course. Um, we use the dome for different sorts of ocean research and um, particularly seafloor visualization. And the reason I'm bringing this up here is that um, we believe that a lot of the things that we work on are also beneficial for the planetarium and dome community in a broader sense. Um, so um, here you can see me and a colleague talking about um, some part of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and you, um, you see a mountain that sits right in the center of the ridge. Um, this is the sort of situation that we have. We go in with a couple of um, researchers and then we work on our data in ways that I'm just about to show you. Um, come on. Okay, so uh, a bit of tech talk here. Um, we have um, a very powerful video system. Um, so two video servers run the playback system, which goes into a switching matrix, which we have because we have this other um, real-time system of five nodes. Um, I forgot to say that we have, we have a five-channel WQXJ system, so pretty standard setup. Um, what we can do with the computers in the back now is we can run um, video playback or real-time stereo, or we can also use our video system as real-time engines. And um, that enables us to have up to four different software platforms running in parallel, and then we can switch between them like zipping through TV channels. And that's pretty handy because um, we're not actually developing a whole lot of software ourselves. We're not at that point yet as a group, but we're evaluating different pieces of software or packages that are out there um, and decide whether we can use them and put them to work for us. So um, the things we do with this system is first of all, of course, we look at video, but not just for pleasure. Um, we, um, in my group, we also develop um, immersive high resolution um, deep sea cameras for research, not just for um, full dome. And we actually use the dome to look at this footage in its correct geomet uh, geometry and at full resolution to actually do science with it. So it's um, in a way, it's a better TV for us. Um, the other thing we do, although we don't actually do a whole lot of outreach, um, the little we do, we produce in the dome itself. So we do video editing in the dome. Um, so um, now coming to the to the simulation part, um, took us a while to get open space to run in the dome on our cluster. But when we did, we started working on um, terrain visualization and speci specifically global bathymetry data sets. So um, if you think of most of the planetarium software that we know, um, the oceans are pretty much just blue or shades of blue. And if you're really lucky, there's gonna be a little bit of geometry, but you can't really do a whole lot with it because everything is so blue. So this is something we wanna change, um, especially because it's unappealing to our researchers. They, they're just turning away from it. Um, so we're doing several things. We're, we're gathering sources for bathymetry that's been done already. Um, we just need to connect the dots there. Um, but we are also working on, cl on clever shader stacks um, offline and online um, to, put this, to put this data into context. So one thing you need to understand about ocean topography, which we call bathymetry, is um, much of that is a prediction inferred from gravimetrical measures. So nobody has actually been there. And especially there is no texture to the seafloor. We don't have a picture of the seafloor like we nowadays do on most of the parts of Mars. So we need to come up with some sort of meaningful textures. We know the geometry and now we are working on shading techniques that make this topography and the height information appear in an informative way, both to scientists and also to the lay audiences. So if you just look at the picture that I'm throwing up here, um, looking at Spain and um, the Eastern Tropical Atlantic, and see, I, I bet you can see a lot of features that you haven't seen on proper maps, on ordinary maps before. And that is because we have been paying attention to this certain way of shading. And my point here is that um, as planetarians, there are tons of stories to be told about this, those 75% or 70% uh, 
of the Earth's surface that we are normally ignoring. This is what makes our planet really special. And these are the stories to be told and we are working on making this public. Um, the other thing is um, we're working with photogrammetry data a lot and we use software packages that are actually not made to run in the dome like this meta shape um, software that we have here in the dome. Um, and what we use for that is OpenGL hijacking, I would like to say. So as long as you have an OpenGL application, we found this company, um, More3D, and they um, hijack basically the buffer that goes, that the software produces before it goes onto the screen. And um, it takes it away and throws it onto a render cluster. And now we can do all sorts of different things with it. We can put it on the dome. So we're not talking about mm, projecting video, we are talking about re-rendering it in a dome environment. Um, it also runs on HMDs, head-mounted displays. You can do stereo, although the software was never meant to do it. Um, well, we have to be a little careful of the time here. We're, we're I know. basically running out for your section. Thank you. So the important thing here is actually that you can collaborate in this and you can actually mix together software that um, does one thing good, but other things bad. So we use this to run software against each other, um, but it also means that um, you can bring much, much more software into the dome as a researcher or as an educator than you thought you could. And I think this is something that I wanted to make sure this community knows about. Um, and there are other vendors um, offering that. And that's from my side. Okay, thank you, Tom. And we'll now move on to Andrea. Right. Uh, thanks for trying to pronounce my name, at least. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's all right. And I must apologize to Tom. I think I mentioned Carter's name instead of Tom's when I introduced the four that's, people. That's so right. thank you once again, Tom. Okay, great. Okay, let's see if I can share my screen here. Uh, so... Um, Can you all see the screen? Very well. Very good. Thumbs up. Okay. So, I've given um, my presentation a an interesting title here. Uh, we call it Ex Exploration, and you can see it's a combination of exploring and explaining. And I, the whole goal for me with these seven and a half minutes is to try to explain why I think this is so important to recognize this confluence, the convergence of the exploring and explaining that's going on in science today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Anders Inderman uh, and I am uh, essentially an amateur astronomer turned atomic particle physicist eventually, and then uh, also a researcher in scientific visualization. My uh, home base is the No Shipping Visualization Center, uh, which is essentially a research facility under the Linköping University with about 100 people working on research in fundamental core computer graphics and scientific visualization. But we also have a, a public uh, dome facility and planetarium connected to us. And this is a, a wonderful playground for us in many, many different ways. And just to flash to you some of the, some of the uh, specs behind that, it's, the, uh, it's a 6P laser stereo dome at this point, And it's primarily the 12 NVIDIA RTX 8000 cards that are, so we essentially have one state-of-the-art GPU per projector per eye, uh, and that's why we can do a lot of experimentation with real-time rendering in, in our dome, which is, of course, very exciting. Now, my main thing here, and this is really what I wanted to stress, and I think this is the, the sort of the underpinning reason why we are seeing this new opportunity to explore the possibility to do scientific research and exploration in the dome setting. Is this sort of uh, interesting fact that in my research, I have been doing a lot of work with many different application domains, not only astronomy, you can see here a medical domain, where I'm developing methodology for volumetric rendering for medical applications. And I can use exactly the same methods, the same algorithms, the same um, data even to do science communication uh, in a public space. And I can do that in exhibits. I can do it in a dome theater. And this convergence of 
the two paradigms that we call exploratory visualization and explanatory visualization is really what's underpinning this whole trend that's going on. And I've, I have invented this word uh, that I call exploration, combining the two, explore and explain. And this is really what we're doing. Uh, and it's not only that we're taking, taking the scientific methodology into the public domain, it's also going back. So there's a cross fertilization that we're actually helping scientists to understand their data better by deploying some of the ideas that we use in science communication. And as Jackie showed as well, this is really a very, very powerful tool that we have. Now, if you want to think about it in terms of how we are interconnecting different disciplines, this diagram is showing you how science communication, data visualization, uh, research on interaction is really forming this sort of a space of interesting research and development project. And in the middle of this, you find this notion of the combination of exploring and explaining, uh, which is really paving the path, I think, for the next generation of science communication, not only in the dome, but in general at science centers. Now, um, of course, one of the main examples of this is the open space project that I uh, uh, that we started up a, a couple of years ago. And I just wanted to give credit to all, all of the people, primarily my own students from the Visualization Center who have been sort of the core engine behind the whole open space project. Now, and if you do this really well, uh, you can take uh, open space and just bring it to the dome and you can do the scientific visualization in the dome, uh, display directly scientific data, but also communicate the science behind that data. Uh, and this is an amazing uh, thing. Now, the reason why we can do this, and I think this is something that we don't recognize enough in many ways, is the, the notion of scaling. Scaling from the workflow situation that you have for the scientists, which is primarily based, it could even be supercomputers, but primarily based on desktop sy uh, systems. Scaling that software to the dome is a non-trivial uh, thing to do. And the reason why we can do this so easily in softwares like OpenSpace, uh, which runs equally well on my laptop as it does in the big dome theater with our NVIDIA Quadra uh, cards, is the underlying piece of software that we call SGCT that we, is also an open source product, which is under the hood inside of OpenSpace, which really, really makes it easy to take any piece of software that you have that's OpenGL based and turn it into a dome uh, enabled visualization setup. Uh, and this is something that we developed uh, a few years ago and it's, uh, it's uh, made available uh, through the efforts at, at our center. So, uh, so if you're interested, if you have your own piece of software, uh, SGCT could be one of those tools that can uh, help you get things to the dome. Now, and this is of course the reason why we can see situations when you have, you can uh, take data straight from your laptop, which fits the scientific workflow. You can put it on a, uh, on a touch table if you want to in, a, in an installation and bring it straight to your dome. And this is what we can do with open space. Now, excitingly, what's happening now is that we are now using the same ideas uh, to bring sort of a general visualization toolkit to the dome. And it's called InVivo, uh, uh, which had tons and tons of different tools for scientific exploration of data. Uh, uh, it's very easy to program. There's a visual programming paradigm. You can also write your own C++ modules and everything. And in the process of merging this together with the, uh, the SGCT toolkit, uh, it will be possible to do general scientific viz with any kind of data and just push the button and bring it into your dome. So take your scanned medical data uh, that you have. You can do wonderful photo mapping of that data if you want to. Um, I always, when I show this video, I always want to show you the, uh, the sort of underpinning equation because this is the, the volumetric rendering equation that you're solving. And, and it's very important to me when I talk to people say, hey, it's not only pretty pictures, I'm solving this equation and I'm solving it 60 times per second per pixel per eye uh, to bring this to you. Uh, and that's, that's important in part to communicate as well about technology and science that we're doing. Now, what I can do then is just to bring that to the dome. Uh, and I can bring the medical data to the dome. Here's an interesting experiment that we did with Connect to do a virtual dissection on the dome and you become sort of the director of the, of the body uh, directly on the dome surface. And it's interactive exploration that you can do collaboratively if you, uh, if you wish. 
Uh, but it also applies to any kind of general data. If you want to bring molecular biology into your dome, uh, you can uh, now, as, you, as well as you can visualize a billion stars, we can visualize a billion molecules on the dome, uh, and you just bring that straight into the dome. Uh, the video here is not of, of greatest quality, but you can see... And uh, I'm afraid uh, we're going to have to, uh, to, to stop. We are running, yeah, okay, yeah. we're running rather late, sorry. Yeah. Uh, you can you can bring that data straight uh, straight to the dome, and you can visualize. Um, uh, we seem to have lost your sound. There uh, is everybody else hearing me? Okay. Right. OK, thank you, everyone. Uh, I didn't see any actual questions in the chat, at least I don't think I did, but uh, by all means, send any questions to the presenters.